Hi there. Have you ever wondered how the language of therapy comes into everyday English? I know that you like listening to things that are psychological. And for those of you that don't know, that's my main job, my main profession. I've been a psychotherapist for over 20 years. Besides my love for therapy, I'm equally passionate about teaching English. And I'm excited to walk you through some popular therapy speak while we also enrich your English vocabulary. Hello, I'm Hilary and you're listening to Adept English. We will help you to speak English fluently. All you have to do is listen. So start listening now and find out how it works. I read an article this week describing common therapy phrases or therapy speak, which has come into everyday English. Often articles in the press, newspapers and online magazines are disparaging about therapy terms. That's disparaging, D-I-S-P-A-R-A-G-I-N-G, and it means putting something down, talking negatively about something. Articles are often disparaging and their favourite put-down word is that these terms are all psychobabble, P-S-Y-C-H-O-B-A-B-B-L-E. Writers often use this coverall put-down instead of taking the time to explore the useful ideas and concepts behind the phrases. The ideas from therapy are useful to everyone if you take the time to understand them. So I thought today I would take some of these therapy terms and give you my own explanations and definitions, introducing English language learners like you to these words. And even if you recognise the idea, you may not have heard the English for it. As ever, a useful English language lesson. Let's get away from the idea of psychobabble and into some useful insights instead. Before we get into that, I just want to remind you that there are hundreds of English language learning podcasts available on our website at adeptenglish.com. It's your one-stop shop for enhancing your English listening skills. Whether you're lounging on a sunny beach or curled up at home on a wintry evening, wherever you are in the world, in other words. I also want to give credit where credit is due. The inspiration for this podcast comes from an insightful article I read entitled, What Really Is Therapy Speak? by Sandy Cohen. The link is in the transcript. She makes the point that a lot of these psychotherapy phrases and terms that have entered everyday English are sometimes misunderstood and misused. I couldn't agree more. Take the term toxic, for example, T-O-X-I-C. It's a popular term amongst younger generations to describe a harmful relationship. But what does it mean in therapy? Well, it's a relationship where you're constantly put down and belittled. It's a recurring pattern and it's damaging, toxic. We usually use the word toxic to mean something poisonous, a substance that shouldn't be there. If there was a chemical factory that leaked chemicals into the land around, we might say that the land was toxic because of the leaked chemicals. A toxic relationship can be that with a partner or a friend or a family member. Sometimes the work of therapy is helping people recognise their toxic relationships and deal differently with them. Often people come to therapy because of the difficult others in their lives. Or they may be the person who's toxic to other people. But the term is also overused, with a relationship perhaps being declared toxic when actually the person just didn't like something the other person said about them. Staying with words beginning with T for a moment, another concept from therapy is that of trauma, T-R-A-U-M-A. -A. And the adjective we use and overuse all the time is traumatic. Previous podcasts on trauma? In podcast 478, I recommend the leading writer on trauma, Bessel van der Kolk, and his book, The Body Keeps the Score, or try podcast 530, where I talk about fight or flight. So a trauma means something very bad that happens to us. It could be a car accident, the loss of a loved one, or a health problem which has threatened our lives. It could be an experience in war. Trauma is almost inevitable in a war situation. Or it could be something unforeseen that threatens our sense of safety in the world, like your house burning down 
or encountering an intruder, a burglar, a thief in your home. Whether the event is traumatic or not isn't determined by the event itself, but by your reaction to it. If after this event you are changed, you feel like a different person, and especially if you can't process and come to terms with it easily, we would call that a trauma or a traumatic event. You can usually tell a truly traumatic event in someone's life because they see their life in two pieces, before the event and after the event. There's a split point in their life, a before and an after, and things aren't the same after. That's when something is truly traumatic. But this term trauma gets used of many experiences in life that aren't really traumatic. It could be a visit to the dentist that was painful and unpleasant, and we might say, oh, it was traumatic. But if we've forgotten it the next day, it's hardly a trauma in the true sense. And the word triggered goes with trauma too. A trigger, T-R-I-G-G-E-R, -G -G -E is the part of a gun which you squeeze with your finger when you want to shoot someone or something. And we use trigger to mean a stimulus, something we see or hear in our environment, which may in itself be quite benign, quite okay, but which causes us to have a big emotional reaction. So if you're traumatised by a medical experience, you may get triggered when you enter a hospital to visit a relative. Or if you're traumatised by a car accident, you may be triggered by passing the place on the road where it happened. If we're using the term triggered in its proper sense, it's a serious, severe reaction. The person experiencing the traumatic trigger is taken in their mind back to the original event and they re-experience it as though it's happening now. But if you're in one of those toxic relationships I described earlier, we may also use that word triggered to mean that certain patterns in that relationship trigger or cause a big emotional reaction in us. And that reaction is bigger because it's all part of a pattern. There's a whole history behind it. So we react more. Again, the misuse of these terms is rife, common. Like my example of terming a painful experience at the dentist as traumatic when we're fine the following day, it's an overstatement, an exaggeration sometimes to use these terms and unfortunately it dilutes the original meaning. The next three therapy speak terms are related. Accountability, agency and boundaries. Accountability or being accountable means accepting our part in a situation. Sometimes in therapy, the job is helping someone understand that they are less accountable than they think. Some people soak up responsibility like a sponge and their habit is to feel guilty, especially about things for which they're not accountable or responsible. Helping them see that they're less accountable than they think is useful. On the other hand, some people have difficulty owning their accountability, especially in relationships. Their pattern is more to see others as responsible or others as wholly responsible, and they're unable to accept their part in it. You might call this projecting the blame onto others. It usually takes rather longer in therapy to address this one. There's often a lot of investment in not seeing oneself to blame. Agency, on the other hand, A-G-E-N-C-Y, means your sense of your ability to have an effect, to change things, to have power in your world. Sometimes people lack a sense of agency. They've lost the ability to take the initiative, see what they can do to solve a problem, sort out their situation. Again, sometimes part of therapy is working on someone's sense of agency. What can you do? to solve your own difficulties. And boundaries, that's such a therapy term, but an important one. You set a boundary, B-O-U-N-D-A-R-Y, rather like a fence or a wall. That's my limit, that's what I'm doing, or that's where I'm stopping the situation, usually to protect myself. A boundary might be, I am willing to spend time with my father but if he starts to shout or raise his voice, I'm out of there. That's my boundary. The article by Sandy Cohen makes a very important point too. 
which is often misunderstood by people. She says, most of the time people won't know your boundaries. So chastising someone for violating your boundaries is a misuse of the term. What she means is that we each are accountable, responsible for setting and managing our own boundaries. So it's no good telling others off for ignoring our boundaries. They're not responsible for knowing where our boundaries are. That's our responsibility. But setting boundaries is really useful and protective. Here's what I'm prepared to do, to tolerate, to offer. And here's where it ends, because I need to look after myself and my well-being. Which brings us neatly on to another therapy term that's made its way into everyday English, self-care. Self-care means looking after yourself. Some people have learned to do this naturally for themselves. Others struggle and have to learn consciously. Self-care can mean what we've just talked about, setting boundaries and not offering too much to others or tolerating certain behaviours. But self-care can be as basic as making sure you eat properly, sleep properly. It can be ensuring you shower, wear appropriate clothing, make sure that you socialise enough, take exercise and take care of your health. And of course, there's psychological self-care, which could involve therapy, but might equally involve reading, yoga, massage, meditation or making music and art. All of these are what we call therapeutic and good self-care. Two more terms in the article I'm going to mention today. The first is gaslighting, that's G-A-S-L-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, and it's from the verb to gaslight. I did a whole podcast on this topic, this toxic pattern in relationships partly because I thought it was an interesting study in the origins of new words in English and how they enter the language. This term comes from a book and a play. If you want to understand more about gaslighting, that's podcast 642. Related to gaslighting, because people with this personality do gaslighting, narcissism is also on the list. That's N-A-R-C-I-S-S-I-S-M. Again, this is a massive topic in its own right. The famous narcissistic personality that we'll all recognise, Donald Trump, is the archetypal grandiose overt narcissist. Grandiose, G-R-A-N-D-I-O-S-E, means full of yourself, superior, seeking admiration, arrogant and of course accepting no blame. So Donald Trump, but there are plenty examples. I think maybe Kanye West may tick some of those boxes for narcissism too. But there are different types of narcissist. There are those like Trump or Kanye that do narcissism by positioning themselves above you, superior. But there are others like the antagonistic narcissist who keeps themselves on top by criticising others. Then there's the covert narcissist, the malignant narcissist, the communal narcissist, and the decompensated narcissist. Narcissism is a much bigger topic, so I'd rather cover it separately. If you're interested, let us know. Narcissism is also on a spectrum. There's a range. And narcissism is just one of 10 different personality styles, which are so useful. I think they should be taught to children in schools. Just my opinion. Anyway, this is just a quick tour of therapy speak that has entered everyday English. As ever, please send us questions or comments or requests for more. And don't forget to listen to this podcast a number of times so that your brain can do its English language learning and you remember the new vocabulary. Enough for now. Have a lovely day and speak to you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you so much for listening. Please help me tell others about this podcast by reviewing or rating it. And please share it on social media. You can find more listening lessons and a free English course at adeptenglish.com.